So, so I have heard at one time the Buddha was staying near Savati in the Eastern Monastery, the stilt longhouse of Megara's mother, together with se several well-known senior disciples, uh, such as Venerable Sariputta, Mahamogalana, Mahakasapa, Mahakachana, Mahakodita, Mahakapina, Mahachunda, Anuruddha, Revata, Ananda, and others. So here we see the uh, Eastern Monastery, it's known as the Pubarama in Pali. And this was a, a, a stilt house. A stilt house is kind of traditional uh, Asian houses that stand on stilts. Yeah, this was very common in India as well. And this was uh, Megara's mother. Megara's mother, of course, is Visaka, Lady Visaka. And she was the one who had donated this monastery to the Sangha. And um, so this is the other big monastery in Savati. There is uh, the Jeta Grove and the Pindakas Monastery. And then there's the Eastern Monastery, the Pubarama, which you're talking about here. Huh? So he was staying there with several well-known monks. So these are all some of the most senior disciples of the Buddha. Yeah, you, if you go to look at the leading disciples, the leading disciples are listed in uh, the Anguttara Nikaya, the numerical discourses, the, the ones, uh, and all of these disciples are there. Yeah, these are all the top, top disciples of the Buddha, if you like. Yeah. So everyone hanging out together, which is kind of nice. Yeah, the Buddha hanging out with all his top disciples. Uh, it probably wasn't very often because Often they would be out on their own, teaching somewhere or traveling somewhere. It would have been quite rare for all of them to stay together. It is like a, you're not using your resources very well. If all the best monks are staying together, your resources are kind of in one place. Yeah? But these are kind of top resources <laughs> in the Sangha. So you want to spread them out into the world to give everyone the benefit of those resources. Okay, now at that time, the senior monks were advising and instructing the junior monks. Some senior monks instructed 10 monks, while some instructed 20, 30, or 40. Being instructed by the senior monks, the junior monks realized a higher distinction than they had before. Yes, higher distinction here usually means like a state of awakening or maybe a, a deep samadhi state. Now, at that time, it was the Sabbat. The Sabbat is the Uposita, the full moon day on the 15th day. And the Buddha was sitting surrounded by a Sangha of monks for the invitation to admonish. That is the Pavarana ceremony, an invitation to admonish. <laughs> this is what you have at the... <laughs> This is what you have at the end of the rainy season when all the monks meet together and you invite the other monks and the Sangha to admonish you, yeah, to correct you if there is a problem in your conduct or whatever. It's a thing we do every year in the Sangha. So they were surrounded together for this. And then the Buddha looked around the Sangha of monks who were so very silent and he addressed them. I am satisfied, monks, with this practice. My heart is satisfied with this practice. So you should rouse up even more energy for attaining the unattained, achieving the unachieved, and realize the unrealized. I will wait here in Savati for the Komodi full moon of the fourth month. So um, what the Buddha is saying here is that this Dhamma that he's teaching, he sees that it works, yeah? And because it works, because the Dhamma works and people are getting results, uh, you should put forth even more energy yeah, for realizing the things that you have not yet realized. Uh, and then the Buddha says that he will stay on for another month. Usually after the rainy season, the monks kind of move all over the place, they scatter all over the north of India or whatever. But sometimes they decide to stay on for another month. If the practice is going well, people are getting good results, then sometimes you stay on for another month. And this is actually mentioned specifically in the Vinaya Pitaka, in the uh, regulations of the monastics, uh, that they can stay on for another month in this way. Uh, mendicants from around the country, when they heard about this, they came down to Savati to see the Buddha. And those senior mendicants instructed the junior monks even more. 
Some senior monks instructed 10 monks, uh, while others instructed 20, 30, and 40. Uh, being instructed by the senior monks, the junior monks realized a higher distinction than before. Now at that time, it was the Sabbath, uh, the Komodi full moon on the 15th day of the fourth month. Uh, and the Buddha was sitting in the open, surrounded by the Sangha of monks. Then the Buddha looked around the Sangha of monks, uh, who were so very silent, uh, and he addressed them. This assembly has no nonsense, monks. It is free of nonsense. <laughs> very funny. <laughs> I don't know why that's funny. It consists purely of the essential core. The essential core is the heartwood. It's the Sara is the Pali word for this. Such is this Sangha of monks. Such is this assembly. An assembly such as this is worthy of offerings dedicated to the gods, worthy of hospitality, worthy of religious donation, worthy of greetings with joint palms. And it is a supreme field of merit for the world. Such is the Sangha of monks, such is this assembly. Even a small gift to an assembly such as this is fruitful, while giving more is even more fruitful. Such is the Sangha of monks, such is this assembly. An assembly such as this is rarely seen in the world. Such is this Sangha monks, such is this assembly. An assembly such as this is worth traveling many leagues to see, even if you have to carry your own provisions in a shoulder bag. So here you have the Buddha praising the assembly of monks, yeah? starting by saying it has, has no nonsense. That's quite funny because it's kind of obvious, I suppose, that there is no nonsense. It consists purely of the essential core. The essential core is like uh, um, the essence of the Dhamma. The Dhamma is all that remains in these people. Yeah, the, what really matters in life, what is important in life, what is the real source of happiness. Uh, everything else is discarded. Uh, and basically, you're dealing with people who have practiced the path all the way to the end. And you can get the feeling that even the Buddha himself is kind of inspired by this assembly, yeah? Because he's inspired, he, I guess he sees that the Dhamma is working really well. Uh, people are getting some extraordinary result in this Dhamma. And that makes him feel good about what is happening, yeah? And he probably wants to teach more. And then he talks about the fact that this uh, assembly is worthy of offerings dedicated to the gods. In other words, uh, these monks, they are like the gods, yeah? If you're gonna to offer to the gods, actually, it's probably more worthy of offerings than the gods. So give, yeah? Give to this as a time to support or whatever. Huh? Worthy of hospitality, etc., etc. Huh? So the Buddha is really kind of praising this Sangha, which is uh, kind of nice. Then he goes on. For in the Sangha, they are perfected mendicants, they are arahants, who have ended the defilements, completed the spiritual journey, done what had to be done, laid down the burden, achieved their own goal, utterly ended the fetters of rebirth, and are rightly freed through enlightenment. There are such mendicants in this Sangha. In the Sangha, there are mendicants who with the ending of the five lower factors are reborn spontaneously. These are the anagamis. They are extinguished there and are not liable to return from that world. There are such monastics in the Sangha. In the Sangha, there are mendicants who with the ending of the three factors and the weakening of greed, hate, and delusion are once returners, sakandagamis. They come back to this world, to the sensory world once only then make an end of suffering. There are such mendicants in this Sangha. In this Sangha, there are mendicants who, with the ending of the three factors, are stream enters, not liable to be reborn in the underworld, bound for awakening. There are such mendicants in this Sangha. In this Sangha, there are mendicants who are committed to developing the four kinds of mindfulness meditation, who are committed to developing the four right effort, efforts, who are committed to developing the four bases of psychic power, who are committed to developing the five faculties, 
who are committed to developing the five powers, uh, who are committed to developing the seven awakening factors, uh, who are committed to developing the noble eightfold path. Uh, there are such mendicants in the Sangha. In the Sangha, there are mendicants who are committed to developing the meditation on love. This is the metta, on compassion, karuna, on rejoicing, mudita, on equanimity, upeka, on ugliness, asuba, on impermanence, anicca. There are such mendicants in the Sangha. In the Sangha, there are mendicants who are committed to developing the meditation on mindfulness of breathing. Yeah. Mendicants, when mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated, it is very fruitful and beneficial. Mindfulness of breathing, when cultivated and developed, fulfills the four kinds of mindfulness meditation. The four kinds of mindfulness meditation, when developed and cultivated, fulfill the seven awakening factors. And the seven awakening factors, when developed and cultivated, fulfill knowledge and freedom. So uh, here the Buddha talks about uh, all of these different meditations. Uh, he talks about all the various developments that you find on the path. Uh, and then he singles out mindfulness of breathing for special attention. Yeah? It is almost as if he's saying here, yeah, mindfulness of breathing is the one thing that you should focus on, the one thing that is at the core of all of these other things. Uh, it's almost as if he's saying that, uh, yeah? So the idea that he brings out mindfulness of breathing in this way, puts it forward in this way, in an assembly where there are so many excellent monks, yeah, some of the best monks are there, the very fact that he does that, it gives like a weight to the idea of mindfulness of breathing. Yeah? It gives, makes it somehow special. Otherwise, why on earth would he... Uh, talk about this whole setting, that all of these monks are there, these various kinds of meditations and all of these things. Uh, it only makes sense in that kind of context. Uh, and then he praises mindfulness of breathing. And these statements right here are very interesting and I think very important. Yeah? When mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated, it is very fruitful and beneficial. Uh, and of course, when the Buddha says very fruitful and beneficial, he means very fruitful and beneficial, <laughs> yeah, to the highest possible extent. It means you can assume that when the Buddha says that, what he means is the development of arahantship, yeah, the development of all and the achievement of all the various stages of awakening. That is what very fruitful and beneficial means when the Buddha talks about these things. And then very interestingly, for our purposes, and what we are doing here now is that it says that mindfulness of breathing, when developed and cultivated, fulfills the four kinds of mindfulness meditation, the four satipatthanas. Yeah, this is such an important point. And this is what the rest of the sutta will show, how it fulfills the four kinds of mindfulness meditation. What that means is that all you have to do is really to develop the breath. Yeah, all you have to do is watch the breath and allow it to develop. And you don't really have to worry too much about alternative ways, like watching the feelings in the body, which is a kind of a very common meditation object yeah, in Buddhism. Actually, the Buddha, never, the Buddha never says anywhere that we should watch the feelings in the body. But he does say very clearly that we should watch the breath. This is what this is about. And that will fulfill all the four mindfulness meditations, including the feelings, including the contemplation of mind, including the contemplation of principles, everything is included in this. So to me, what this means is that it is a mindfulness of breathing that is the main meditation object to do Satipatthana practice. Otherwise, why does he say this? The Buddha does not say anything else. He doesn't give any other object in this way that actually fulfills Satipatthana meditation. It is only the breath that is singled out in this particular way here. So for me, this is a very powerful statement. Uh, and it says a lot about how meditation should be done. Uh, breath meditation is the source. Uh, this is the basis for all the other developments of the mind. Uh, of course, breath meditation is very profound. Uh, and it is not easy, yeah? it is not just 
watching the breath, it is understanding the obstacles on the path, it is trying to understand what is hindering the development. So it is not as if it is easy, not at all, but still it is one object. And we know when we keep to that one object, then we are on the right track. So it's both simple, uh, but also it is not necessarily easy to do because it uh, demands a lot of purity and all of these kind of things. Uh, and then the four kinds of mindfulness meditation, when developed and cultivated, fulfill the seven awakening factors. Yeah? And they include samadhi, they include upeka. So by doing the mindfulness meditation fully, completely, it takes into account also the samadhi and the samma samadhi, the jhanas and all of that uh, at the very end of the path. Uh, and the seven awakening factors, when developed and cultivated, they fulfill knowledge and freedom. Uh, Knowledge and freedom is here uh, vidya vimutti. Vidya is the opposite of avidya, which is ignorance. So it fulfills the insight uh, that we are trying to achieve on this path. So if you develop the samadhi all the way to upeka, then the knowledge will be the consequence of that. You will see things according to reality. You may not actually need to do all that much. It happens almost automatically if you do this in the right way. So this is very high praise for the idea of mindfulness of breathing. This in many ways proves that this is the main meditation object as taught by the Buddha. So how is it practiced? Yeah, this is why this has become so interesting then to actually find out how we do the mindfulness of breathing here. And so I will go through it. I will not go through it in as much detail as I usually do because uh, uh, we cannot go through it in great detail every time. I don't think that makes any sense. But I will go through it enough, hopefully, so you can understand how it actually works, yeah? the basic ideas of this. Uh, because we are coming to the end of the retreat, so that there's a limit to what we can actually uh, uh, capture on, in this remaining time that we have. Uh. So the Buddha says, and how is mindfulness of breathing developed and cultivated uh, to be very fruitful and beneficial there. And he says, it is when a mendicant has gone to the wilderness uh, or to the foot of a tree or to an empty hut. Uh, they sit down cross-legged uh, with their body straight uh, and establish mindfulness uh, right there. Just mindful, they breathe in. Uh, mindful, they breathe out. Uh, so this is like the preliminary instruction for the mindfulness of breathing, yeah? And uh, very interesting here is how it starts out. Gone to the wilderness, the foot of a tree or an empty hut. Yeah, this is the general idea of seclusion. And it sa says something to all of us that the, of the importance of seclusion for real meditation practice to happen. If you're really going to meditate, if you're really going to have success in meditation, a degree of seclusion is very useful. So what does this mean in practice? Well, first of all, it means that very often it is nice to become a monk or a nun. So you can go off into the forest. You can have your own little hut yeah, and, and live in that little hut. That's one of the great benefits of being a monastic. Yeah? If you are a lay person, then sometimes to go to a nice retreat center that is far away, that is kind of in the forest somewhere, maybe a bit like Jana Grove or, you know, whatever you have, which is nearby where you live. Or it can also mean that if you live in an apartment or you live in a house, that you have a special place where you sit in meditation. Maybe you have a little room that is just for meditation practice, or at the very least you have a corner of a room that is your meditation practice. And when you go there, you are by yourself. Yeah, you, you do that practice in a, in a solitary fashion. So it is possible to have conditions, even in Leila, that are more suitable than other conditions. It is hard to go to the wilderness, perhaps, but it's possible to have something which leans in that direction. And this shows you, again, the importance of seclusion on the Buddhist path. The more you start reading the suttas and you start looking for these words, you find that actually seclusion is found everywhere. It's one of these fundamental ideas. And the reason why it is so fundamental is because uh, when you have the seclusion of the body, the kaya viveka, 
then the mind also becomes secluded. First of all, you then become secluded from all the noises in the world, all the things that happen in the cities, that happens in civilization. But also when you withdraw from that world of the cities, of people and all of these kind of things, uh, it is as if you are removing yourself from the sensory world a little bit, uh, moving away from the sensory delights in the world. Uh, and that movement away from that becomes then makes it possible for the mind to relinquish those things. Uh, if you're always impacted by the senses at all times, uh, uh, the things, the advertisement and all the things in the world screaming out, look at me, see here, listen to this music, taste this wonderful food, have these beautiful relationships. If this is always screaming out to you from every corner of the city, it's, it makes it much, much more difficult. In fact, it makes it impossible really to do proper meditation practice. So seclusion is really uh, fundamental if you want to go really deep yeah and you want to have real success in meditation of course that does not mean we cannot do still do meditation we can but it's, it's unlikely to reach the same depth that's really the point here sit down cross-legged this is the standard posture of meditation practice uh, don't have to sit cross-legged but it is a, it is a good posture here you have your body straight, yeah, so you, because when the body is straight, you have a bit more awareness, but wait till the mind clears up a little bit, then you straighten the body. In the beginning, you can relax a little bit just to establish the mindfulness, but after a while, the body straightens up. Sometimes it does that naturally, yeah? and then you establish the mindfulness right there. Parimukkang satting upatapetva, this beautiful little phrase. So you establish mindfulness first, yeah? The Pali says again, parimukkang satting upatapetva. Upatapetva is a particular kind of verb, which means you do it first, yeah? You establish mindfulness first. It's uh, called an absolutive uh, ver verbal form, and it is the thing that you do before something else. So first establish mindfulness, then do the mindfulness of breathing. This is what I've been saying all the time, right? And this is one of the main places to where this is pointed out. First establish mindfulness, then do the mindfulness of breathing. And in practice, what that means? Well, it means that first of all, you have to practice the six first factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, yeah? Sometimes for a long time, maybe for years and years and years to become really deep in your virtue, your kindness, your right view. It also means that when you sit down, you relax, first of all, you try to let things go, you let go of some of the business of the mind, and you allow the mindfulness to emerge. You don't make the mindfulness emerge, yeah? It is you allow it to emerge. You just guide your mind very gently in the right direction, reminding yourself of the uh, uselessness of the worldly things, and then turning your mind towards meditation practice instead. So you establish mindfulness. Yeah, this is what you do first. Then medit real meditation begins. Where do you establish mindfulness? Right there. Right there means right here in the present. Yeah, first of all, in the present in terms of time, not in the past, not in the future, but right here in the present, but also the present as present in space. In other words, right here in front of you, yeah? right here with your breath, your breath, where is your breath? Well, your breath is right here. That is where you have your mindfulness. Then just mindful, they breathe in, mindful, they breathe out. And that little word there, which is very interesting, the word just, this is Eva in Pali. And, it, and uh, the idea here, and this could be that I'm maybe over interpreting a little bit, but the word does mean just, yeah? So just mindful, the idea is that there's nothing you need to do, yeah? You don't make the breath in one way or another way. You don't make a lot of effort to do this. You are just mindful. You allow the breath to be, and you are aware of how the breath actually works. This is really the, the meaning behind this. So breath meditation is just an awareness of what is naturally present. So, and you just have to stand back and kind of not be involved and allow the process to happen by itself. 
That is really the idea behind this. Uh, so a very simple thing really here. Yeah. Once those initial qualities have been established, that is when the meditation really happens. So this is how the meditation is described. Uh, so this first part here, the uh, mindfulness of breathing is divided into four parts and each of those parts corresponds to one of the Satipatthana practices. This is the first part, it has four items to it and uh, this is the part that corresponds to the body contemplation, yeah? Kaya Nupassana. So this is what it reads, this is what it sounds like. Yeah? When breathing in heavily or long, they know I breathe in heavily. heavily. When breathing out heavily, they know I breathe out heavily or long. When breathing in lightly or short, they know I am breathing in lightly. When breathing out lightly, they know I am breathing out lightly. They practice breathing in, experiencing the whole body. They practice breathing out, experiencing the whole body. They're practicing breathing in, stilling the body's motion. They're practicing breathing out, stilling the body's motion. So when we start out, the breath can be a bit heavy yeah, or quite long. We're still kind of in the process of relaxing or allowing things to kind of calm down. And then as the meditation progresses, it goes from being long and heavy breath, and the breath becomes a bit more shallow, a bit more light, yeah, because you are calming down, you are kind of uh, moving towards something more pleasant. But you are already aware of the breath. There is very few distractions already, because you have already established mindfulness beforehand. Yeah, so this is the sequence here. Then the next part here is experiencing the whole body, sabbakaya, patisangvedi. And um, uh, the first thing to notice here is that it says practice. The previous one says no, they know. First you know, then you practice. So what does that mean? Well, I would say what it means is that in the beginning, because you are mindful already, you have established mindfulness, it happens naturally. You just know that the breath is heavy. You know that the breath is light. This happens just because you are mindful already. But to know the whole body, yeah, it takes practice. It takes time before you get there. The fact that they say practice does not mean that you have to do anything. It doesn't mean that you have to exert willpower, that you have to kind of grasp the breath or anything like that. It just means that it takes a bit of time before you get to this point. But if you let go and you allow the process to happen, then eventually this is exactly what will happen. You start to experiencing the whole body. What does the whole body mean? Someone asked that question just the other day, and I'm going to explain that now, exactly what that means. But before we explain that, let's do a little bit of meditation and then do some Q&A here. So here we are. So we are talking about the breath meditation. We're talking about the very first part, the first four stages. And uh, uh, this is the equivalent of the body contemplation. And we have come to the idea of experiencing the whole body. So what exactly does that mean? Yeah, and uh, the, one of the very important points here is this idea. Well, first of all, let me, let me take it from a slightly different angle, first of all. Uh, uh, the body is here explained in the commentary to mean the breath. Yeah? Sabbakaya means the whole breath body. That is what the commentary says. Uh, and if the commentary says that uh, already there is, you know, unless we have very good evidence to the contrary, we should usually go with the commentary. The commentary was written down by people of a lot of insight and understanding, and we need to have good evidence to go against the commentary. So already there, there's good grounds for thinking. It means experiencing the whole breath, the whole breath body, if you like, because the breath is like a body. But even more important than the commentary is when we come to the end of the sutta later on, I'll show you as we come down further on, it actually says there that the breath is called a body among bodies. 
Ja, ka Jesu kajanjatra is what it says there, quite specifically. So in the same sutta, it says that the breath is called a body. Yeah, and, and, and the context is exactly this, the body contemplation, what we're doing here. So because it calls the breath a body among bodies, to my mind, it is almost certain that this is what it must mean here. How else are you going to interpret if that is already in that sutta? This is the second reason. The third reason is that, well, this is called anapanasati. It is called mindfulness of breathing. It is not called mindfulness uh, of the physical body. Yeah, it is, it is called mindfulness of breathing. So it makes very good sense that we should have following the breath, going deeper and deeper on the breath, and not suddenly go from the breath to the physical body, and then back to the breathing again later on, maybe. That doesn't really make any sense. It makes much more sense that we are dealing with the breath all the way through. So to my mind, there is very, very good reason to think that this means the, the uh, whole breath body, the entirety of the breath. Oh. So how is it possible that the word body can mean breath? And the, the reason is because the word body does not mean body in the same way. Kaya does not mean body in the same way as body means body. The English word body very usually means the physical body. But even in English, the word body can mean a group of phenomena. We can talk about the corporate body or a body of evidence, for example. It means a group of things yeah, coming together into a body. And that is exactly what it means in Pali, but it's used even more like that. The word kaya means a group of phenomena being grouped together because they have similarities. Yeah. So um, this is exactly how it is defined, and it's used like that in many, many places in the suttas. So the way you could translate this, you could translate this as they practice breathing in, experiencing the whole phenomenon. The whole phenomenon, yeah, the whole thing, the whole phenomena, the breath is a phenomena, and all the phenomena which are breath is called the body of the breath. So they experience breathing in the whole phenomenon. And when you understand in that way, or the whole thing almost, uh, then you kind of get closer to the idea of what actually is meant here. Uh, this to me is the uh, obvious meaning. If you ask Ajahn Brahm, he will agree with that. Uh, that's also his understanding of this. Uh, and uh, there are some people who disagree. There are some Vipassana schools in particular where they disagree with this understanding. But uh, to my mind, it is, uh, it, it, it doesn't really fit very well, this idea of feeling the whole physical body. But in the end, yeah, I, I, there's no need to kind of be too harsh on anyone and to kind of make every, anyone kind of uh, uh, be, be wrong or whatever. But the most important thing is that the meditation works. Uh, and if it works for you to go to the whole body and then you can do that, of course, you can do that. Uh, but uh, if you are going to follow what I think the Buddha is saying here, he's definitely talking about the breath. Uh, so feeling the experience in the whole breath, well, what exactly does that mean? Well, it means just that your awareness is becoming more powerful. As the meditation is progressing, the awareness is expanding. And as the awareness is expanding, you can see more of the breath. Yeah? You can see all that there is aspects of the breath, the beginning, the middle, the end, etc., etc. The whole experience of the breath. I should say here that, uh, you know, one thing I forgot to say is, well, exactly how do you watch the breath? Or where do you watch the breath? Do you watch the breath on the tip of the nose? Is it the belly? Where is it? Uh, and I did mention this very briefly before, but uh, uh, it doesn't say anything about in the sutta where you should watch it. Uh, and because it doesn't say that, all you have to do is just to know the breath is going in, the breath is going out. Uh, and if you're able to know it's going in, it's going out, forget about the body, just know that much, and that is sufficient. And you don't have to know it anywhere specific, you just follow it, yeah, it goes in and out, and you can know that quite easily without fixing it to a particular place on the body itself. So that is how I understand this. And then the next one is where you breathe in, stilling the body's motion. The body's motion here is the kaya sankara, and kaya sankara 
is defined elsewhere in the suttas as the breath. Yeah? And of course, here, when we are doing the meditation, now we are already, already calming things down a little bit. Yeah? Things are becoming quite nice and still. And uh, the only thing that is really going to be left at this point is really the breath. Yeah? The breath is going to be the main motion that you are aware of as you're breathing in and breathing out. Uh, and so now you're calming down the breath, uh, stilling the breath, the practice breathing in, stilling the breath, you could translate this as uh, the practice breathing out, stilling the breath, calming down the breath. This is really what is going on here. So now we are already, you can see here, what is happening here? Uh, what is happening here is that your mindfulness is becoming sharper. Uh, you are aware of more of the breath. Uh, and not only is your mindfulness becoming sharper, but the whole experience is starting to calm down. It's becoming more still. It's becoming more beautiful, more delightful as you do this kind of practice. So already you're seeing some kind of development. So this is equivalent to the body contemplation, the Kaya Nupassana in the Satipatthana Sutta. Let's now move on to the next one. So uh, the next part here, the next four stages, uh, this is equivalent to the Vedana Nupasana, the contemplation of feelings, uh, the second of the four Satipatthanas. Uh, and this is what it says. Uh, they practice breathing in, experiencing rapture. This is piti. Uh, they practice breathing out, experiencing rapture. They practice ex breathing in, experiencing bliss. This is sukha. The practice breathing out, experiencing bliss. The practice breathing in, experiencing these emotions. This is the citta sankara. The practice breathing out, experiencing these emotions. The practice breathing in, stilling these emotions. The practice breathing out, stilling these emotions. So here we are moving into the area of feelings, yeah, the Vedana Nupasana. And uh, it starts off with rapture, which is piti, and then it talks about these emotions further down. This is citta sankara. And uh, these emotions, of course, basically that refers to the same emotions that we're talking about before, the bliss and the rapture, except that uh, here we are calming them down, making them more peaceful. So this is a very it's, here it starts to get very beautiful. Yeah? It's all about calm and bliss and happiness all the way through. It starts off with rapture. So uh, one of the questions that sometimes arise is, well, sometimes people can become very peaceful with the breath, uh, but they're not really able to move on to the rapture, the happiness, the joy in the meditation. So why is that the case? Why do they become peaceful but cannot move on to the rapture? Uh, and one of the reasons for that could be that you are still too attached to the body. Yeah? So you're holding on too much to the body. You're not willing to uh, or able to feel that rapture uh, as much, uh, possibly. Or it could simply be that you're not inspired enough at this particular case. Uh, the inspiration is too low. Uh, and this is where the idea of using a little bit of inspiration can kind of uh, make you leave the body a bit more behind and start to experience these beautiful rapture states instead. And the next sutta, we will have a look at the Mahanama Sutta, have a look at that hopefully before we finish today, uh, shows us how we can access uh, that rapture, that inspiration that makes these positive feelings actually come up. So sometimes all we have to do is just to nudge the mind very slightly here, yeah? move it slightly in one direction. And when we do that, uh, then the uh, uh, bliss and the joy will happen, come up as a consequence. Uh, so you calming down the breath, yeah? This is what happened in the previous step. But then as you calm down the breath, uh, if you're heading in the right direction and your mind is in the right space, then rapture, bliss will start to arise. The more peaceful, the experience is of the breath, the more likely it is that you will have rapture. And if the rapture does not come, come up automatically, then you use a little nudging of the mind to make it come up. So you breathe in, you're still using the breath as the anchor, but together with the breath, rapture starts to rise. And this coursing joy often felt physically in the body, felt in the mind as well, of course, body and mind. 
And it starts to get very, very pleasant uh, when you come to this particular point. Uh, and as you practice, that rapture becomes more refined. Uh, and that more refined aspect of the rapture is here called bliss, uh, the sukkha. Yeah, so it becomes more refined. Some of the coarser physical aspects, uh, they die away a little bit, uh, gradually calming down, becoming less and less prominent. Uh, and then uh, comes you practice breathing, experiencing these emotions. And this is chitta sankara. And this is just another way of saying that you experience both rapture and bliss. Because this is these emotions is referring back to those two uh, faculties. And then continue breathing, always just breathing, allowing the process to happen by itself. There's no need to uh, push the process forward. It's the nature of this process that it uh, happens by itself, then the whole experience, the whole bliss, the whole pity, it calms down, it stills, it becomes even more peaceful. So it's a very powerful and beautiful thing. Yeah, it is incredibly attractive. And you will notice again, this idea, this is what I mentioned at the very beginning of this retreat. There are two things that are powerful indicators of whether your meditation is going well. One is whether your happiness is increasing, whether you're getting more and more bliss and rapture, less and less suffering in your practice. This is one very important part of it. And the other part is whether it is all calming down. Yeah, We talk first of all here about stilling the breath, then about stilling the emotions. It's a continuous calming down. There's two things, more and more happiness, more and more peace. And the two main indicators of whether your meditation is going well. This is what we see throughout this uh, mindfulness of breathing exercise. Uh, the other thing, and this is one of the things I pointed out during the Satipatthana Sutta, yeah, we are here looking at the uh, contemplation of feelings, right? Uh, and remember that the Anapanasati, it fulfills, it completes the contemplation of feeling, which is very interesting, but the completing of the contemplation of feeling is done only by experiencing happy states. This is what I was saying before. There's nothing here about suffering. There's nothing about contemplating pain. There's nothing about contemplating the worldly feelings or the worldly happiness of the five senses or any of that. All the negative feelings, all the worldly feelings are left out. All you are left with is spiritual bliss, spiritual happiness. And the Buddha says specifically, this fulfills the contemplation of feeling. And this is kind of, again, I, I pointed this out before, but it's very powerful because it means that all of that negative contemplation, staying with the pain, trying to focus on the pain, understanding the pain, how it arises and all of that, actually, it is not really required. Yeah, we can bypass all of that. We can, if the meditation becomes painful, shift your legs, sit on a chair, do whatever, carry on afterwards. But actually, we can bypass all of that pain. And this is such a wonderful way of thinking about meditation because it makes meditation much more of something that contributes to our life, makes our life better rather than detracting from our life and making the spiritual path into something that actually is unpleasant. So it's a very, very, I don't know, this is very eye-opening. It's a sort of different way of thinking about spirituality from how we normally think about it. Let us carry on with the mind. So now we come to the contemplation of the mind. This is a uh, the same as the contemplation of the mind, the citta nupassana, that we find in the Satipatthana Sutta. And this is how it is explained. They practice breathing in, experiencing the mind. They practice breathing out, experiencing the mind. They practice, practice breathing in, gladdening the mind. They practice breathing out, gladdening the mind. They practice breathing in, immersing the mind in samadhi, or if you like, stilling the mind. They practice breathing out, stilling the mind. They practice breathing in, freeing the mind. They practice breathing out, freeing the mind. So here we are dealing with citta, nupassana, the contemplation of the mind. Yeah? And um, 
Uh, what, what exactly does it mean to experience the mind? What does that actually mean? You might think that, well, we experience the mind all the time. Yeah? When we think or when we kind of close our eyes and we have the inner feelings, well, that's the mind right there. Yeah? There are feelings there, there are thoughts there, perception, all of these kind of things. But, well, so what exactly does it mean here? And what it means is that when, to be able to experience the mind, you have to abandon those things that are not mind. What are the things that are not mind? Well, basically the five senses, yeah? We have six senses. One of them is the mind. The other ones are not the mind. You have to abandon the five senses. So what, we are, what is happening here is that the five senses are starting to fade away here. They're kind of going into the background. And instead, when they are going into the background, the mind becomes more, comes into its own right. And one way of experiencing the mind in this way, when the mind comes into its own right, is with the nimitta. This is what the nimitta is about. It's called the obasa in the suttas. Yeah? The nimitta, seeing the light in the mind, that is precisely what you see when you... Uh, let go of the five senses, maybe not completely, but at least to a large part, letting go of them. That is the experiencing of the mind. And of course, that experience of the mind is again, very, very powerful. Yeah, incredibly attractive. You are attracted to this light. It is so blissful. It is so peaceful. It is so non-self in many ways. You're giving up so much of yourself. Incredibly enjoyful, enjoyable peace states of mind. So, Sometimes when people do the anapanasati, the mindfulness of breathing, they can have a lot of joy and a lot of positive emotions, but they cannot access the nimitta. Why is it that they cannot go from the emotions to the nimitta? And one of the main reasons for that is because when you, uh, there is usually still a degree of attachment to the body or the five senses. That is why you cannot make that leap because when the nimitta arises, you are giving up a very large part of sensory existence. So sometimes at this point, what you have to do is you have maybe have to remind yourself a little bit about the downside of the sensory world, the downside of the body. At this point, because it is very peaceful, you cannot really think about these things. It is more like you're just nudging the mind and saying, yeah, why, you know, don't hold on to these things. There's nothing there of interest anyway. And when you gain a little bit of insight, understanding that there is nothing of interest in that world, then it is more easy to make the jump from the positive emotions to the mental experience itself. Or you can do this kind of practice before you start your meditation. Yeah, that is even more powerful sometimes. As you are giving rise to mindfulness, well, you want to get a distance to the world anyway. You want to get rid of the future and the past. You want to understand a little bit about the downside of the five sense world. You can do that at the very beginning. And because you do it at the beginning before you start, then it is more likely the thing will just flow automatically when you come to this point. Because you have like programmed your mind, if you like. It's pre-programmed and it just follows the program. And then this happens uh, by itself. So you experience the mind. And then as you start experiencing the mind, you deepen that practice. Yeah. So you practice breathing in, gladdening the mind. Practice breathing out, gladdening the mind. How does that happen? Well, you keep on breathing. The breath is still there, probably in the background somewhere, very weak. But you keep on just following along. Now you're mostly just focusing on the nimitta and the bliss, but the breath may still be around. And you gladden the mind. And the gladdening of the mind is like a... Again, an automatic process. It's like the nimitta becoming more bright, more powerful, etc. And you gladden you, the whole experience becomes even more powerful. Maybe you would think it is impossible to become more powerful than this. But actually the point is it can become even more powerful. And sometimes this is why people sometimes get a bit scared of these states because it is so incredibly powerful. Yeah, You draw you, this, this feeling of the of a kind of your, your being, who you are, is being taken over. And in a sense, that is exactly what is happening because you are giving up yourself 
That is why these things are happening, because you're giving up the sense of identity that you have. You're giving up the will, you're giving up all of these personal things. This is the only way you can experience that. So it feels like this powerful thing is taking over. And that is why it can become so, can seem frightening, but there's nothing to be frightened about, because it's just a very enjoyable experience. And then when you come out afterwards, well, you are there again. You can continue just like before. Nothing has really changed. It's just a tempor temporary blissful experience, that's all. Huh? So you just enjoy it, huh? because it is extraordinarily enjoyable, obviously. Yeah. And then, as the mind gets gladdened, uh, you carry on still with the same thing, the same kind of breath, uh, and now you allow the samadhi to become stronger and stronger. Uh, the mind coming together, less and less movement in the mind. Yeah? Again, this idea, more and more bliss, more and more stillness that I've been talking about, talking about all the way through this. And eventually, as you do this, you come to the very last stage, which is the freeing of the mind. Breathing in, freeing the mind, breathing out, freeing the mind. Freeing the mind from what? Freeing the mind completely from the five hindrances. Freeing the mind completely from the five uh, senses. Completely freeing the mind from the will power as well, because now the samadhi becomes complete. And at this point, when you free the mind in this way, this is where you enter the jhana states. So the mindfulness of breathing takes you all the way to the jhanas. The freeing of the mind, the vimutti, this is one of the words that is used to describe the jhana states in the suttas. Vimokas, yeah? Vimuttis or vimokas are what these things are called. So an extraordinary journey. Yeah, and all of this or most of this happens before you get to jhana. If you look at that list there of all the calmings and all the blisses and everything, all of that is part of the path towards jhana, moving towards jhana. This is what this is all about. So there's so much happiness to be had on the path, even before you get to the otherworldly states known as the jhana, which are at the end of the world. Lokanta is what they're called in the suttas, because you leave the world of the five senses behind. So that is the mindfulness of breathing for you in brief. brief. And these are the first 12 steps. And now let's have a look at the last four steps where we are dealing more with the inside part of this. So here it is. They practice breathing in, observing impermanence. They practice breathing out, observing impermanence. They practice breathing in, observing fading away. They practice breathing out, observing fading away. They practice breathing in, observing cessation. They practice breathing out, observing cessation. They practice breathing in, observing letting go. They practice breathing out, observing letting go. So what is this all about? Well, once you have come out of your meditation, yeah, the meditation goes up, it comes maybe to a peak, it is hard to know exactly what that peak will be. It may be you only get to the calm breath, maybe you get to the nice feelings, maybe you get to the nimitta, or maybe you get all the way to the jhanas. Yeah? If you get all the way to the jhanas, then this contemplation is going to be very powerful. It, if you go to a more shallow uh, experience of the meditation, this contemplation afterwards is also not going to be as powerful. So when you come here observing impermanence, uh, what you are observing is the process that you have just been, th been through. Uh, you've just come out of your meditation and now you look back on that meditation. Uh, yeah, this is what I mean by inference, uh, seeing things through inference. You're no longer observing directly, you're now looking back on what happened. Uh, and when you look back on what happened, uh, what you are seeing is you are seeing impermanence. Uh, you're seeing things always changing. Nothing ever remains the, sa the same. Yeah? You see the movement of things, uh, nothing being reliable in a certain way. Yeah? But then uh, as you look more deeply, you start to see it is not just that things are impermanent, uh, but that the impermanence has a particular direction. Uh, and the direction is that things are actually fading away. Yeah? Things are becoming less prominent. Uh, 
things are gradually disappearing in view, yeah, in your experience. And eventually, if they keep on fading away, there comes eventually a point when they will stop altogether. You reach cessation. So this is what you are seeing. When you look back on the process of meditation that you have been through, yeah, what you are seeing is this. You see things being impermanent, changeable. Then you see things fading away and eventually ceasing. So let me give you an example of, what, of how this works. First of all, you see the, uh, the body is still there. You see the body is like impermanent, different kind of feelings. And as your meditation deepens, the body starts to fade away. You don't feel the body so much anymore. Yeah? Maybe there's a little bit of pain sometimes that you feel, but it is fading away more and more and more as you go deeper in the meditation. And there comes a point in your meditation when the body is basically gone. That may happen when the nimitta arises, or at the very latest, it happens when you attain a jhana state. It is completely gone. Impermanence fading away, then cessation. Physical body. Same thing is happening with the five senses, gradually disappearing. The last sense to go is usually the hearing sense. And then the hearing is completely gone, the cessation of the five senses. The will, the same thing, gradually disappearing until you enter a jhana and the will is completely gone. The hindrances of the mind, same thing, impermanent, fading away, completely gone. Certain perceptions, certain feelings, yeah, the, happy, the painful feelings gradually fading away, the PT arising and then fading away afterwards, yeah, becoming less and less. And as you contemplate this, what you actually are contemplating is the five khandhas. Yeah, the five khandhas is precisely the experience that you have during your meditation. And now you can see the various aspects of the five khandhas being impermanent, fading away, and eventually reaching cessation. When the body is gone, yeah, certain feelings are gone, certain aspects of the khandhas have actually disappeared. So this is how you contemplate the five khandhas, yeah? looking at their fading away during the meditation experience. If you think back, we were talking about the five khandhas in the Satipatthana Sutta, I said I was going to explain later on how it is you contemplate those things, the origination and vanishing. This is how you contemplate the vanishing, yeah, right there. This is how it comes about. You can also be contemplated in a deeper way, the vanishing when you die and then taking them up when you get reborn. It's two different ways, but this is one way of doing it. And as you keep doing this, Again and again and again, you see the cessation of these things. You see the five khandhas, or most, a lot of them, disappearing through the jhana experience. There comes a point when you're no longer interested in these five khandhas because you understand that they are inherently impermanent. You understand that they are dukkha because when they are gone, you feel much better. And you also understand that they are non-self because when you practice in this way, you have no longer have access to them. You have no longer have access to the body in a jhana state. And as you keep doing this, there comes a point when you let go, the very last factor on this path. And letting go here, patinisagga, means the ending of craving. We are no longer holding to these things at all. So you observe the impermanence. You observe the fading away of things. You observe the cessation. And by seeing cessation, you understand Anicca, Dukkha, and Anatta in a very deep way. And when you understand those things again and again in a very deep way, there comes a point when you let go, when you no longer have any interest in these things. And that is where the deep insight into the five khandhas really happen. You become a stream winner as a result of that. Let's do a few minutes of meditation together here. Okay, okay. so let's carry on. So... Uh, Okay, so that is the, uh, in brief, the um, Anapanasati Sutta. I have gone through it fairly quickly because uh, it is a very interesting sutta, but uh, uh, I think now I want to move on. I've gone through it in greater detail on earlier retreats. 
So let's uh, carry on with the sutta and uh, finish it off. I'm going to go even faster for the last parts here because they are even uh, less uh, kind of not as directly relevant, but still very interesting, at least some of them. So let's have a look at the last part here of the Anapanasati Sutta. Uh, so then the Buddha says, he says, mindfulness of breathing when developed and cultivated in this way is very fruitful and beneficial. And how is mindfulness of breathing developed and cultivated so as to fulfill the four kinds of mindfulness meditation? Whenever a mendicant knows that they breathe heavily or lightly or experiencing the whole body or stilling the body's motion, at that time they are meditating by observing an aspect of the body, keen, aware, mindful, rid of desire and aversion for the world. Yeah, so the first four, this is what the Buddha says, that the first four exercises on the Anapanasati is the same as the body contemplation. This is where he says it, you know, directly. There's no, it's very obvious. For I say that the in-breaths and out-breaths are an aspect of the body. Or to be more direct in the way this is phrased, he's saying that the in and the out-breaths are one body among bodies. Yeah, this itself, the breathing, is a kind of body. It's a kind of conglomeration. It's a group of phenomena coming together, phenomena coming together. So this is what I was saying before. The breath is specifically said to be a body or an aspect of the body here, right here in this, uh, in this particular sutta. So, um, and then the Buddha says, that's why at that time a mendicant is meditating by observing an aspect of the body, keen, aware, mindful, rid of desire and aversion for the world. Then it goes on. Whenever a mendicant practices breathing while experiencing rapture, experiencing bliss, experiencing these emotions or stilling these emotions, at that time they meditate observing an aspect of feelings. This is the feeling, Vedana Nupasana, keen, aware, and mindful, rid of desire and aversion for the world. For I say that close attention to the in-breaths and out-breaths is an aspect of feeling. That is why at that time a mendicant is meditating by observing an aspect of feelings, keen, aware, and mindful, rid of desire and aversion for the world. So this is a little bit obscure, but I think in the uh, Chinese translation of the sutta that you find for the Sarvastivadin version, it actually says there that uh, uh, these feelings, the feelings of happiness, uh, they are an aspect of feeling. And because they are an aspect of feeling, this is why this is called feelings, uh, contemplation of feelings. Uh, here it says, it talks about close attention, which is a little bit more difficult to understand. But in the Chinese, it specifically says, these are feelings. That's why you're contemplating feelings at this point. Kind of very quite obvious, I think. Yeah. And then whenever a mendicant practices breathing while experiencing the mind, gladdening the mind, or stilling the mind or freeing the mind, at that time they meditate observing an aspect of the mind. They're doing the citta nupasana, keen, aware, mindful, rid of desire and aversion for the world. And then it says there is no development of mindfulness or breathing for someone who is unmindful and lacks awareness. And here again, the uh, version in Chinese has that uh, if you observe these things, well, you are observing an aspect of the mind. So that's why you're doing citta nupasana, the contemplation of the mind. And to me, this uh, the version in Chinese makes more sense. This is a little bit less obvious why, why it is phrased in this way. So I tend to follow the, uh, the Agama version found in Chinese instead of the Pali in this particular case. That is why at that time a mendicant uh, is meditating by observing an aspect of the mind, keen aware, mindful, rid of desire and aversion for the world. Very repetitive, but uh, anyway, the last part, whenever a mendicant practices breathing while observing impermanence, or observing fading away, or observing cessation, 
or observing letting go. At that time, they meditate observing the dhammas, yeah, the principles or the phenomena, keen, aware, and mindful, rid of desire and aversion for the world. Having seen with wisdom the giving up of desire and aversion, they watch over closely with equanimity. That is why at that time a mendicant is a meditating, observing an aspect of principles, keen, aware, mindful, rid of desire and aversion for the world. So what we are seeing here uh, is that simply you give up desire and aversion completely, yeah? And then when desire over aversion is gone and you achieve, say, maybe the fourth jhana, that fourth jhana is what looks upon the situation and that is where <coughs> you observe impermanence fading away and cessation. And from that, that is where you can get the really profound insights on the path. Uh, uh, so that is that last explanation, I think, makes more sense uh, and it kind of uh, uh, works yeah, with how, how this path actually, uh, the basic progress of the path. Uh. So let me continue on this one. I'll finish it off. Uh, that is how mindfulness of breathing, when cultivated and developed, fulfills the four kinds of mindfulness meditation. Uh. And how are the four kinds of mindfulness meditation developed and cultivated so as to fulfill the seven factors of awakening? Whenever a mendicant meditates by observing an aspect of the body, at that time, the mindfulness is established and lucid. Yeah, if you do the practice of body contemplation in the right way, watching the breath in the right way, your mindfulness is sharp. Yeah? At such a time, a mendicant has activated the awakening factor of mindfulness. They develop it and perfect it. So merely by watching the, uh, the breath, you are developing the mindfulness factor of awakening. As they live mindfully in this way, they investigate and explore and inquire into the principles, into that principle with wisdom. This is what I meant before. You, investigate the breath, you overcome any remaining defilements, you understand the beautiful qualities of mind, you understand the dark qualities of mind, the bright qualities of mind, the blameworthy qualities of mind, the blameless qualities of mind, the wholesome qualities of mind, the unwholesome qualities of mind, and you divide this up and you understand what it is that you have to do. The things that are bad you have to give up, the good qualities you continue developing. Yeah. This is why it is so important to have a good understanding, not have any doubt about what is good and what is bad, all the way to the very depth of the mind, even these very subtle things like this. At such a time, a mendicant has activated the awakening factor of investigation of principles. They develop it and perfect it. As they investigate the principles with wisdom in this way, their energy is roused up and unflagging. Yeah, as you investigate the mind, you overcome some of the negative things. You are inspired by what is going on. You are developing the mind in the right direction. Your energy starts to come. The bliss is starting to happen. It gets very, very interesting yeah? because you are seeing things that you have never seen before. The meditation is becoming extraordinarily attractive. And because it's becoming extraordinarily attractive, the energy is there, the interest in, is there, the inspiration is there, the bliss is starting to come. So this unflagging energy, un in other words, it doesn't decline, it is a steady kind of energy. At such a time, a mendicant has activated the awakening factor of energy. They develop it and perfect it. When there are energetic spiritual rapture arises. At such a time, a mendicant has activated the awakening factor of rapture. They develop it and perfect it. Spiritual rapture is the niramisa piti, piti niramisa. In other words, the piti that comes from spiritual qualities, not the piti that comes from worldly qualities, yeah? the joy or happiness that comes from the five senses. This comes from the spiritual aspect of, of life. When the mind is full of rapture, yeah, the spiritual rapture, the body and mind become tranquil. You keep on meditating. Yeah, that 
as powerful spiritual rapture after a while it calms down you start to become even more focused and as you calm down the bliss becomes even more powerful so again tranquility and bliss developing together becoming more and more powerful at such a time a mendicant has activated the awakening factor of tranquility they develop that and they perfect it when the body is tranquil and they feel bliss Suki, suki no is the, the word here. And this is a, a word you find elsewhere in the suttas. Uh, when the tranquility becomes really profound, bliss arises in the mind, even more happiness. <laughs> One happiness after the other. You are tranquil, then you have bliss. And when you have bliss, the mind becomes stilled in samadhi, even more calm, even more peace, yeah? deeper and deeper. Yeah? At such a time, a mendicant has activated the awakening factor of immersion the awakening factor of samadhi they develop it and perfect it they closely watch over that mind in stillness that stilled mind at such a time a mendicant has activated the awakening factor of equanimity equanimity they develop that and perfect it eventually taking it all the way to the fourth jhana, where the upeka and the equanimity reaches its peak. So this is how the four, the uh, satipatthanas develop the um, seven factors of awakening. Yeah? And then the same idea happens with the other satipatthanas, yeah? the three satipatthanas on feeling, on mind and on principles. And in exactly the same way, the seven factors of awakening develop based on each one of them. Yeah? So uh, whenever a mendicant meditates, observing feeling, an aspect of feelings, the mind, the principles, then the mindfulness is established and lucid. And then each one of the factors of awakening is developed as a consequence. Uh, investigation of principles, energy, rapture, tranquility, samadhi, and equanimity. That is how the four kinds of mindfulness meditation, when developed and cultivated, fulfill the seven factors of awakening. Yeah. And how do the seven factors of awakening fulfill and cultivate so as to fulfill knowledge and freedom? Yeah. It's when a mendicant develops the awakening factor of mindfulness, uh, investigation of principles, energy, rapture, tranquility, immersion, and equanimity, which rely on seclusion, fading away, cessation, and ripen in letting go. That is how the seven awakening factors, when developed and cultivated, fulfill knowledge and freedom. So this very last part here probably needs a little bit of explanation because it may not be immediately obvious, but you can see that there are many of the factors there are similar to what we saw in the Anapanasati Sutta. You see the fading away is the same. This is Viraga in Pali. The word cessation is the same. Yeah, you contemplate cessation. This is Niroda in Pali, and it ripens in letting go. And uh, the Pali word here is Vosanga, the Pali word we had before was patinisaga. Patinisaga and vusaga are very closely related to each other. And they both basically mean letting go. So it's a very similar kind of idea. Yeah? But uh, what we are seeing here is uh, maybe used in a slightly different way. Here we have the idea that these awakening factors, uh, yeah, they rely on these things. They don't happen without these things. This is what you really is necessary for the awakening factors to reach maturity and go to all the way to the end of the path. So seclusion, we already talked about seclusion. You have to have the seclusion even to do mindfulness of breathing. Yeah, here you can argue the seclusion is a bit deeper. Here the seclusion probably also includes the seclusion of the mind, the citta viveka. So the seclusion of the mind means the seclusion from the five hindrances. Uh, yeah? It means that the uh, mind is freed from those things. Uh. And then uh, the fading away and the cessation, well, this refers to exactly what I was talking about before. As you go through the meditation process, things fade away and they cease. Yeah? And these seven awakening factors, their development depends on this. Uh, 
the more things fade away, the more things come to an end, the more prominent the awakening factors become. The less there is in your experience, the five senses are gone, the body is gone, the will is gone, all you are left with is bliss. Well, at that point, the awakening factors are very powerful, very strong, because so much has ceased, so much has ended, so much has faded away. And then you take it even further, you go into the jhana states, and with each jhana, a variety of things are ceasing, coming to an end. And this is again where the bhujangas become even more powerful, and the maximum power ending up with the fourth jhana, when there's almost nothing at all left in the whole world. All that is left really is this feeling of equanimity, yeah? That is all that is there, and some kind of uh, uh, um, remnant of the uh, feeling of rupa, which is uh, very hard to uh, put your uh, point out actually at that particular point. Uh, and the more you develop this in this way, the more things have ceased, the more powerful your mind is, and then it ripens as letting go. It ripens as the ending of craving, the whole process coming to a stop as a consequence. So this is how this process of the awakening factor, when developed and cultivated, fulfills knowledge and freedom. This is where the path becomes very exciting, yeah, and very profound and very deep. And it can be very difficult to uh, relate to some of these things. Uh, but uh, so this is just to give you an idea of where this is heading. Uh, it is heading to this, all these extraordinarily uh, amazing insights and understandings of reality. Uh, that is where it is all going, ultimately. And this is how the very humble breath, yeah, the most humble thing in the world, the thing that we carry with us all the time, the thing that upon which our life depends without the breath, we're not going to go very far. This humble thing is also what takes you to awakening, understanding, insight, liberation. It's kind of extraordinary that this actually happens in this way. So there you are. That is the Sutta on mindfulness, uh, the Sutta on mindfulness of breathing, I should say. And uh, that is uh, where it comes to an end. So that is the brief, brief version of the Anapanasati Sutta. And um, we are coming now very close to the end of this little Sutta retreat. And I think we, I think I will just carry on a little bit because uh, I want to cover the last two suttas also, if possible. And uh, we're going to probably have to do them fairly fast, but only two sessions left. So I think I'm just going to uh, carry on. Actually, before we come to the next sutta, we have a nice little table that shows you the connection between Satipatthana and Anapanasati. Let's have a look at that table first of all. Huh? So here you are. This is uh, Satipatthana and Anapanasati compared. Uh, Satipatthana on the left, Anapanasati on the right. So um, Satipatthana practice, yeah, uh, it has First of all, we have the body contemplation, and we have seen that the main body contemplation is the 31 parts of the body. With Anapanasati, we have the breathing heavy, heavily, breathing lightly, experiencing the whole body and stilling the motion of the body. So this is kind of interesting, right? Both of these are the body contemplation how it is explained in Satipatthana, how it is explained in Anapanasati. And it may look like these things are quite different. They don't really have all that much to do with each other. But actually, they're very closely related with each other. And the reason is that for the mindfulness of breathing to be able to develop properly, as I've been saying all the way throughout, you have to loosen your attachments to the body and to the five senses. And so using this kind of contemplation in the Satipatthana Sutta, it allows you to loosen a little bit your attachment and holding on and your desires for that particular world. So they work together. Yeah, you do Anapanasati, and if it doesn't work very well, you can do a bit of contemplation. You maybe use the four elements if you prefer that. Yeah, and then you find that the, when you do the Anapanasati, it strengthens your ability to do the body contemplation. They kind of work together in this way. Huh? And that's why there is a slight difference there, but they really, 
work together yeah, in, the, in, the, in a very kind of obvious way once you understand it. Then we have the feeling, yeah, the feelings uh, and uh, in the uh, Anapanasati Sutta, mindfulness of breathing, the feelings are very simple. Yeah? It is the rapture, it is the sukha, the bliss, and then it is these emotions, which really just re refers to rapture and bliss again. Uh, Chitta Sankara usually means uh, Vedana and Sanya in the suttas, and Vedana and Sanya, feelings and perceptions. And the feelings and perceptions you have now, well, they are rapture and bliss. That's the main aspect of those. So translating as these emotions, I think, is quite appropriate. And then you still those emotions, yeah? So it is all the niramisa, sukha, the happiness related to spirituality. So if you compare this to the feelings in the Satipatthana Sutta, there it is much more diverse, yeah? You feel the pleasant, painful, and neutral feeling. You know that you're feeling those things. When you feel a worldly, pleasant, painful, or neutral feeling, you know you're feeling a worldly, pleasant, painful, or neutral feeling. Yeah. When you feel a spiritual, pleasant, painful, or neutral feeling, they know that they are feeling a spiritual, painful, pleasant, painful, or neutral feeling. Yeah. And so you can see here that the uh, Anapanasati Sutta is focused on a very narrow part of the feelings of the Satipatthana Sutta, yeah? Only on the spiritual pleasant feelings. That is all it is connected with. Everything else is left out. And remember, the point here is that that is enough. The rest of the feelings can be understood by inference. They can be understood by the absence, yeah? It's enough to focus on the positive feelings, the positive spiritual feelings. It's one of those beautiful results that arises from reading this in the right way. And here you have the contemplation of the mind, yeah? And again, the contemplation of the mind in the Anapanasati Sutta is very limited, yeah? It is limited to experiencing the mind, and as I, the way I mentioned that, it is a very blissful experience, experiencing the nimittas. You come out after experiencing all the positive feelings just before. Then you have the gladdening of the mind. You have stilling the mind and finally freeing the mind. All of these are very positive experiences, something that things that are very, very enjoyable. And so they really only refer to the very last part of the contemplation of the mind in the Satipatthana Sutta, which is the expansive mind, the supreme mind, the mind in samadhi, and the free mind. That is what it refers to. These are very closely related to each other. And again, it shows you, you don't actually have to contemplate all of these things. The idea of the mind with the desire and non-desire, you can understand again, through its absence, when these things are completely gone, just like when the tadpole comes out of the water and becomes a frog, only then can the tadpole understand what water actually is. As long as you are immersed in the water, it is very difficult to understand what that water is. You come out of the water, you come out of the desire, out of the ill will, out of the delusion. Okay, now I understand what these things are. You understand them through their absence, not through their presence. This is a standard way of understanding things by inference. So again, there's a lot of things here we don't have to do. And one of the things I should maybe say at this point is that it is also not uncommon in Theravada Buddhism and in more Vipassana-based meditation to just contemplate the mind, just being aware of the mind in daily life. Yeah? You're walking about and you are aware of the states of the mind and then you stop any negative states from arising yeah, because you are aware of what is going on in your mind at all times. And then they call that citta nupasana, contemplation of the mind. But I think that is a misunderstanding of the contemplation of mind. What I would call that being aware of the content on, of your mind, stopping the negative things from arising, encouraging the positive things, uh, to me that is just uh, sense restraint. Uh, it is part of right effort. Uh, it is not part of the contemplation of mind, uh, because contemplation of mind is actually very profound. Yeah? 
It is all of the things that we have seen here, all the blisses, the nimittas arising, and this kind of thing. This is what it really is about. So again, it's important to put things on the right place of the path. If we underestimate the profundity of some of these experiences, if we call just being aware of the mind in daily life, if we call that chitta nupasana, well, then we are degrading a little bit the meaning of these things. They're actually very profound. Yeah, it really belongs with uh, right effort. So it's actually a more preliminary practice. It is not as profound. This is actually very profound. Satipatthana practice, anapanasati, is a very, very beautiful and profound practice. And we need to not lower it down, make it less than it actually is. I think this is very important. So that is the third tetrad, yeah, the, the third part of the Anapanasati Sutta and the third of the four Satipatthanas. And this is mostly about calming the mind down by attaining samadhi, attaining the stillness of the mind. And really it is at this point that we start to deal with real insight in a deeper way, the last Satipatthana and also the last tetrad on the path. Yeah? So here we have the comparison again. And uh, 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 so uh, here I'm comparing it only to the idea of giving up the five hindrances. Yeah. So you can see here the comparison, you understand how the sensual desire arises. Well, that's a bit about impermanence. You understand how when it has already arisen, it is given, given up. Well, this is the same as of observing the fading away and cessation, and then how, once it is given up, it doesn't arise again in the future. This is practicing the observing, the letting go, yeah, completely. So here we're dealing more with insight, more with understanding the nature of these defilements in the proper way. And as we understand the nature of these, these defilements, well, then we can actually get rid of them once and for all and make an end of them. And then the samadhi becomes much, much easier as a consequence. So uh, there you are. So uh, I said I was going to carry on with the next sutta. I never got to that sutta, but we'll get to that uh, after the break. So let's do a little bit more meditation together, then do a Q&A, and then have a little, little bit longer break afterwards. So.